plenty of time to do a thorough review of kidney pathology. Uh, Samira and I will be your resident nephrologist learning with you, and we are joined by the one and only Sri Sharma. Go ahead and introduce yourself. So I am Sri Sharma. I am a kidney pathologist at Arcana Laboratories. So today, the aim of today's talk is to review kidney pathology. So we are not going to discuss a lot of pathogenesis and other aspects. So we are going to focus on kidney pathology. And we will try to cover many disease entities focusing on kidney pathology. And specifically, I would like to focus on IF as well as electron microscopy. Because I have seen fellows, they get scared when they look at EM and they don't know how to approach it. So I will try to cover disease entities in which EM is important and I will cover those disease entities which you encounter frequently in your practice during your fellowship, you know, and in exams. Frequently, you will see these questions pop up again and again in conferences when you attend. So I want you to have enough confidence and enough knowledge so that you can approach a disease entity in a comfortable way. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions uh, during the session. So be around, have your keyboard and answer them within 10 to 15 seconds, because that will help me. And the purpose of the question is not to test your knowledge. The purpose of the question is to make sure you understand. Because as soon as you say something, you interpret an image on your own. Certainly, you learn a lot. So let, let this be a bilateral conversation between you and me. Because it is a Zoom, so I, we won't be able to let everyone talk. But you can chat. So as soon as I ask a question, please type your question. And Matt and Samira will be handling the chat box and I'll be focusing on the biopsies. So for first one hour, close to one hour, we will do the live session. I will show you live images and we will discuss those cases. And in last half hour, because it is only one and a half hour session, I will focus on very high yield areas of pathology where the images are classical and you get to get those questions time and again. So last half an hour will be a very concentrated review on very high yield areas, okay? So first one hour will be live and still I will try to cover most important disease entities. And so I will start sharing my screen. So you all can see my screen? Yes, looks great. Oh, perfect. So well, let's start. We, so we, we actually just opened up the chat so um, everyone will see everyone's chat. So feel free to share any questions, comments or thoughts. Okay, perfect. Fantastic. So, so this is like uh, the DJ, the kidney pathology D DJ. Yes. That's and you can good. switch on the music if you want. <laughs> so let's start with a normal. Okay. So this is a normal kidney biopsy. And I say normal because glomerulus is normal. There is no proliferation at all. And the tubules are normal. They are back to back. And I don't see anything within the tubules. So if you see an image of a normal kidney biopsy, what are you thinking from the presentation side? Clinically, what can be the presentation? Why this biopsy might have been performed? Can you give me some indications of this biopsy? So as you it's are typing transplant your- transplant biopsy. Yes, perfect. That is a good example. Um, um, this can be a transplant biopsy, a protocol biopsy. Uh, There's some, uh, some comments here. People said proteinuria, AKI, nephrotic syndrome, minimal change disease, Alport syndrome, microscopic hematuria. Okay. So in this session, yes, all of those answers are possible, but we are going to discuss the most common scenarios. Transplant is definitely a possibility, like a protocol biopsy, or you have a prerenal stuff going on. That is definitely a possibility. Microscopic hematuria is definitely a possibility. Proteinuria, less than commonly two grams or very mild proteinuria, you can again see a normal biopsy. Minimal change disease is also a possibility. In minimal change disease, also the biopsy is going to be absolutely normal. So to make a diagnosis, you will need immunofluorescence and electron microscopy. So in this case, immunofluorescence was negative. And I'm showing you the electron microscopy. So if I give you this electron microscopy, what is your diagnosis?
Several people are putting minimal change disease. Into Perfect. The I'm showing you two different images, but the finding is still the same. Okay. I'm seeing a glomerular capillary loop with a lot of red blood cells. This is the glomerular basement membrane. And I cannot see the podocytes. They are all effaced in this one. They are all effaced. So these podocytes are completely gone. And this is the another image showing you the same finding. Podocytes are completely gone. So great job. Yes, this is minimal change disease. And okay. I do like how you, you include the images with the red blood cells. <laughs> I yeah, think it favorite. should be a rule. All EMs must include the red cells so you can tell exactly where you are. You are absolutely or, you could, or you could use the podocyte to do that. Yeah, I agree. So your next image or your next case, okay? So I'm going to jump quickly to the finding, okay, on this one. And I'm going to show you something and I will ask you the purpose of what I'm doing and why am I doing. So I ended up focusing on a gland in a very typical way. So what do I want to show? And I'm raising this question because in exams, when you see images, the power or the magnification of the image and the stain which the pathologist or whoever is making the questions is using, there is a purpose to that. So if in the exam, if I am giving you that image, what is what can be the purpose of this image or this field is the question. Can you make a diagnosis on this image? And I will tell you my feedback on this one. So feel free to There's write. There's a co comment about PAS stain. Perfect. Uh, me yes. Membranous. Okay. Good. Yes. Let, let it come. Tell me what else you are thinking. I'm going to give you a hint. Okay. I could have shown you this image at this power, but instead I ended up choosing to go on high power. So if I'm going on high power on an image, particularly on a gland, definitely one purpose can be, I'm trying to ask you a question on the GBM thickness. You ended up picking up membranous in a right way. But if I have to ask you a question on membranous, silver stain would have been more appropriate. So I'm not showing you a silver stain. I'm showing you a PS stain, which you absolutely correctly picked up. One thing I wanted to point out, see this glom is occupying the complete field, which I'm showing you. So in glomerulomegaly, That's huge. You are, yeah, that is a huge glom. So in a glomerulomegaly, if I'm focusing on a high power, if it occupies more than 50% of my field, it is glomerulomegaly. So I'm trying to show you the glom is huge. Okay, so it's an indirect way I'm giving you a hint. Hey, this is a huge glom. Can you make a diagnosis on it? So indirectly, this is a glomerulomegaly, okay? And then in the same field, in the same case, in the next field, I'm showing you a lesion of, can you give me a diagnosis on this one? So FSGS, someone Perfect. put into the chat. Awesome. So I gave you segmental sclerosis and I gave you glomerulomegaly, two findings on the same case. So basically on a biopsy, what story am I making? On a biopsy, I'm trying to take you towards a diagnosis of adaptive FSGS, like obesity. Patient is having one kidney, where your kidney is struggling and there is a glomerulomegaly and you are having adaptive FSGS. So if I give you a combination of enlarged glom, and if I give you a combination of segmental sclerosis, I'm going to take you towards adaptive FSGS. Is that making sense? Yes. Perfect. So. FSGS, do you all remember, like we have spoken about it as a primary and secondary. If I ask you on the histopathology, tell me one thing, only one thing, which will help you to differentiate between primary and secondary. What is going to be that thing? You, have, you get only one question to ask your pathologist to differentiate between primary and secondary FSGS. What is that question? Anyone? Matt, any responses so far? I'm looking here. Um, looks like podocytopathy. EM yes, exactly. Placement. Perfect. I love that. So yes, if you have to ask me only one question, because clinically you are suspecting primary FSGS because you have nephrotic syndrome in your patient. If you have to ask me one question, that question is going to be, what is the extent of foot process effacement? The morphology, which I'm going through, is mostly for academic purposes and gradually to just to make a diagnosis of FSGS. And in exams, 
And in different scenarios, you will be asked <clears throat> common questions on the type of FSGS. Nowadays, we don't use it, but there are a few histological types which are considered as important because of the outcome. And this is the example of one of those histological types, which I just showed you. You ended up having a look at it. And I'll show you some more lesions in the same glomerulus. And this is the another lesion in the same case. This morphologically is very, very classical. So can you diagnose this morphology for me? Uh, we have a comment for tip lesion, tip Lots variant. Of tip, tip variant, nodular. Nodular. You all are doing awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, this is a tip variant. And you ended up making that diagnosis because this is segmental sclerosis, no doubt. And there are a lot of foam cells which are interact within that area. And I ended up showing you another lesion of segmental sclerosis, which is attached to the origin of the proximal tubular pole. This is the definition of the tip lesion. The area of segmental sclerosis is attached to the tubular pole. So you got the answer right, tip. So these patients are going to present with nephrotic syndrome and generally outcome is better for these patients. It's very close to minimal change disease. That's why this morphology is important to understand and you will see it frequently. Being Only asked. one glom needs to have, be uh, attached to the proximal tubule area yeah, or I agree. one? Only one. You need only one. Only one. Okay. Only one. So I'm going to show you one more case now. Pretty and cool. this is easy morphologically. Segmental sclerosis. Okay. You can get a diagnosis very easily. Segmental sclerosis is there. A lot of chronicity is there. Now the trick comes if I give you an image, which is again, very classical, uh, very classical, and I want you to think or give me a diagnosis on this one. What is the first thought which comes to your mind? Sorry, if sure, I show you, you this- Can you review for us what stain we're looking at? This is PAS. And the way you make up PAS, because see the uh, tubular basement membranes, they are going to be pink. Let me put up uh, HNE just for comparison. So most of my uh, slides today are going to be PAS. And the way you will know immediately is by looking at the tubules. See, this is HNA. You cannot see the basement membranes properly. It's very pink. So HNA is pink and PAS will highlight the basement membranes. So you can make a diagnosis even on this slide. So tell me your and, thought. And the HNA, HNA, you can see the red cells, but PAS you cannot. Is that correct? Yes, you're right. Yeah. So you can see the red cells over here in the background, yeah. So there's some comments in the chat about Alport foam cells. You all are doing great. I have no doubt you are going to excel in exams. So yes, when I see that image, my classical thought process is Alport, okay? And it can be another things also, like any disease which is going to cause proteinuria for a long time, can have that morphology. But if I am going to get that image in an exam scenario, my first differential should be Alport, okay? So I have some more EM images. So for that adaptive FSGS, which I had shown you in which there was glomerular megaly. Sorry, sure, there's a question. Um, can you point out the foam cells in that last image? Yes, I can. And sorry, I think I missed it. Can you explain again why this is classic for Alport? So when I'm seeing so many, it's not like the histopathology, that is the one of the first things you should think. If I'm looking at segmental sclerosis and ton of interstitial foam cells, they are not specific for Alports. Any case which has a long-standing proteinuria can have interstitial foam cells. And this one, from the classical perspective, we are leaning more towards Alport in this one because the extent of foam cells is a lot. And in this case, if I end up adding a stem in which I make a history of classical Alport, you know, I'll give you a young male who has deafness, who has family history, you got only one diagnosis. But on biopsy, if I give you this field, Alport is very high on your differential. You will have other differentials also, like a long-standing membranous you will have. But in this case, the extent- Are you saying of these right here? This white, this white background. Yeah, right here, Matt. Yeah, you ended up picking up. 
Yeah. So those are those are foam cells. Mm-hmm. Those are all foam cells. Can you go a little bit uh, higher power so we can just take a look at the cells themselves? Yeah. Can you see them? They are outside the tubules, just hanging out. You can see the tubular basement membrane outlined very nicely, and in the background you see those foam cells. And so those How were it... tubules. See, those are tubules. Basically, they've been working so hard with the proteinuria that they've turned into... And it's a long-standing proteinuria. So that's why interstitium ends up accumulating a lot of foam cells. Okay. So how come, you don't, how come you don't see this in other proteinuric kidney diseases? Why just... I think it might be because of the duration. We don't know the exact cause for it. It might be because of the duration. Because we do see foam cells in a long-standing membranous. Like, occasionally, I will see a membranous, like a stage three, a stage four. The patient is having membranous for, like five years and 10 years, which was not properly controlled, you will end up seeing interstitial foam cells in that. So any disease which causes long standing proteinuria, you will see foam cells. But questions wise and classical scenario wise, what I have seen, uh, Alpot is in books and everywhere is associated with a lot of interstitial foam cells. So if I am asking a question in which the stem is taking us towards the hereditary nephritis or Alpot, and if I give you this image, you will think about it, but again, this is not diagnostic. So you have to look at the EM and you have to, you can do an Alport stain also on the biopsy. So I have the EM I wanted to show you in which you can suspect it. What does it look like were, on H&E? H&E. That, that was well, PAS. So what was That H&E? was PAS. In, on the h you will see same foam cells. And let me just bring up the h Can you see that? Oh, it's man, beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can watch it for hours. It's beautiful. You can see the tubules nicely in the background and the interstitium is completely full of foam cells. Okay. I see that. Sorry, can, yeah. you, center that? can you center that again for a second? It's foam cells, yeah. Yeah. So it looks like the tubules that don't have foam cell appearance are also abnormal looking. Uh, maybe they're in the process of becoming that. Is that... Kind of what we're or you, they were undergoing atrophy in the background, right? Because gradually yeah. you will see chronicity. So a bunch of tubules are undergoing atrophy. The cells are getting damaged and some of the tubules are intact. Okay. Very good. Any other questions on that? looks like very important lesion to think yeah, about. Yeah, this is very important lesion. Like you might end up getting a question on that. Uh, like, I remember that was H and E right there. And so. And this is the EM. So. EM, you saw the foot process effacement. In this case, also, there is a foot process effacement. But can you see the GBM? GBM is so thick. And can you see those lines going along the GBM, like the line structures? So the GBMs are laminated. Will they ever give you on a board uh, question um, not the GBM size? Or is that something that the fellow should be able to do? And GBM size, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I have, I have not taken nephrology both. <laughs> so, but if I don't have to give you a thickness on this one, like if I'm designing this question, I don't have to give you thickness on this one because morphologically, this GBM is abnormal. Right. The reason you don't is- see the foot processes. Yes. And you could see those um, GBMs are normally very regular, right? In this one, you don't see that regularity. You can see those textural abnormalities. Mm-hmm. You can see those lamellation. So this is an abnormal GBM. But if I have to give you a thickness, like from the exam perspective, I will make it thin. You know, and then I will say, because in Alports or hereditary nephritis, normally the GBMs are thin. So if I have to make up a GBM diameter, I will say 180, 100, 200, or something like that. I will make up a GBM thickness and that will be less. So if you have to associate in your mind, associate that with a thin Can, can you GBM. explain what lamellation is? Sometimes there's some confusion about that. Yes. Can you see those lines going along the GBM? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are lamellations. It's lamellated, like one layer over the top of the other. It's lamellated. Many people call that as a basket weave also, like the weaves going along the basket weave. So, Yeah, I was going to mention the basket weaving. I remember uh, Michelle Rowe talking about that. Okay. So those are the classical buzzwords, for exam. And this is the image which you might end up getting. So type four collagen abnormality is very common in Alports. So you do a stain on the biopsy. You can do it on a uh, immunofluorescent stain. It's a frozen section stain. So this is normal. The alpha two chain is normally expressed. That's why you are seeing that stain, which is red 
fluorophore here present within the GBM, Bowman's capsule, as well as the TBMs. When you do the alpha-5 stain, it is completely negative. Same glom over here, it's completely negative. So you ended up confirming your diagnosis that yes, your patient has Alport syndrome in this one. This stain is very specific, but it is not very sensitive, okay? Now, um, in a woman that has um, uh, one copy of the um, Alport gene, you'll see a mosaic pattern? It might not be as classical, you know, like it, because typically males will manifest that, but females also will have it. But it might, might not be as classical, but as the disease will progress, they will. But the X link um, uh, sort of, uh, you'll have one chromosome that will be uh, muted, right? I thought, yes. and so you'll mm -hmm. see a mosaic pattern. That seems yes. to be something I like to test a lot. Yeah, I agree with him. Yeah. So you're seeing mosaic on the IF? Yes. Sometimes you can see that. Yeah. So I showed you a very classical case. It was completely absent, but sometimes only say GBM or only mosaic pattern, only the patchiness, only some parts of the GBM will show you the stain, some parts won't. But in exam, that will be a very difficult thing for me to show unless I'm giving you something classical. I have to give you a classical history, ended up showing you the image, which was classical for hereditary, then EM, and then I can use that Alport stain. Like from a nephrology fellow showing a mosaic pattern of IF, it's a mm -hmm. difficult ask. But again, I'm not saying it cannot be asked, but that would be difficult. So we I would like to- We can do it. We, we, know, we know our path, Shree. We can yeah, answer that we question. Can do that. You are doubting the power of nephrologists. I'm not doubting that, I'm, but I'm saying, fellows, like once you stay in practice for a few years, but for, for fellows to me, that there, there is a lot to learn. Like trans, they are learning a lot of stuff, right? So kidney pathology is not on the top of their mind, right? Mm -hmm. In the so once they come in the practice, gradually they will learn more. Anyone but want to put in what this uh, stain is? I want fellows to pick it up. I want my trainees to pick it up. Give me no, the stain. No, I'm asking them, yeah. So uh, yeah. please chat, what is the stain here? And the diagnosis. This is a very classical field. You will see this field okay, in exam. Everyone's, um, everyone's every, everybody it. said PAS. And? Yeah, that's great. Um, so the silver stain would actually look uh, black, the collagen. The trichrome uh, would be bluish, the collagen. Uh -huh. So we have a comment about fractured cast. I think someone had said cast nephropathy earlier. Okay. Um, after there, a few people said trichrome. After this, can you show us a trichrome maybe to show us what that looks like? Sure, definitely I'll show it. But I want them to make a diagnosis on this part. This is a classical field. So, so I want everyone to comments get comments for high van collapsing glomerulopathy. Perfect. So everyone in the audience should get it. This is a PA stain. This is collapsing. Hyvan is a good answer. If I give you the history of HIV and all that, you can definitely say this is Hyvan, okay? The most important thing for you to know is that in the low part, why did I say this is classical? Because see the background in this one, there is a microcystic dilatation of the tibules. Can you see that? The tibules are dilated. They have PS positive hyaline cast. Mm -hmm. And in the low power itself, you can see the gloms. This glom, this glom over here, you can see them. And you cannot see the normal architecture of the glomerulus. It is the tuft of the glomerulus is collapsed. And that's why you ended up saying that this is collapsing glomerulopathy. So let me show you silver. Silver stain is very good for picking up collapse, okay? Now, I, we should also mention a lot of people were putting um, myeloma and cast nephropathy. And yeah. I always get confused by that too. And is that because the lines are like, this is just an artifact of, of cutting it and not, not necessarily the um, glass cut uh, appearance. I think the, I think the best way to tell is that, is that the, those casts are PAS negative. Awesome, Samir. Yes. From a fellow, again, there are a lot of variations. Again, we are not talking about all the variations which can happen in real life. We are talking about classical scenarios. Yes. When you talk about cast and nephropathy, I have to frame a question. Normally, they are PAS negative or pale. In this one, most of them are PAS positive. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. again asking you a question from the conference perspective, you know, like from the classical perspective. So in this one, I'm showing you tibules of variable sizes. If I have to ask you a cast nephropathy, I am not going to ask you or show you this classical image. 
I will, I have, I will show you cast nephropathy in a short while. And that is going to be different. So in this one, I'm showing you the collapse and I'm showing you the variable size tubules. I'm not showing you any cellular reaction around the cast and the cast RPA is positive. So that's why you will make an interpretation that most likely I'm not dealing with a cast nephropathy. Again, you will have the question stem and other parts of the questions to help you to make the diagnosis. Sorry, okay. sure. could you go back for a second? Someone wanted to see the collapsing tuft again. Yeah, I wanted to show you that on a different stain, but this is the oh, collapsing okay. tuft. Can you see that? The tuft is completely gone. Can you uh, zoom in a little bit? So students might be accustomed of looking at the proliferation of overlying visceral epithelial cells. So let me find a lesion, which will show you that. Because in a particular biopsy, this is the classical lesion, which most of you are accustomed to looking at it. Like the tuft is collapsed and there is proliferation of the overlying visceral epithelial cells. And there are prominent protein resorption droplets. So that is, in short, I ended up describing a collapsing morphology. So if and, you look and by at visceral this... epithelial cell, you mean podocyte, right? Podocytes, yeah. They are proliferating. They are trying to fill up that space very fast. And they have protein resorption droplets in it. So I have seen uh, fellows, they end up getting confused this with crescent very frequently. So the way I ended up describing that was a classical description for collapse. So if I have to ask you or show you why this is not a crescent, because this is there is no fibrinoid necrosis and there is no GBM rupture in it. That's why this is not a crescent, this is a collapse. And you can see those protein droplets, you don't see those protein droplets in crescent. And the tuft is completely gone. I'll show you a crescent also. <clears throat> so How you will know, know there's not G GBM rupture in that. Hot it's difficult in this one from a, uh, from a fellow perspective, it is different. So in actual life, I will know this is not a GBM rupture because I'm having multiple sections on this one, multiple levels. I'm not seeing any RBC cast and I can look in the background. And in this one, it is just because of the cut because glom is a three dimensional structure, right? So you are always looking at different cuts. In this one, whenever I'm going to track a particular GBM, I'm always able to track it. This particular proliferation is not running over the GBM. In a crescent, what will happen, this proliferation is going to run over the GBM and you will actually see the discontinuation. In this one, whenever you focus on an individual GBM, you can completely draw a line. It's always complete. This particular proliferation is respecting the boundary of the gland, uh, the tuft. It's going around that tuft. In a crescent, it is not going to do that. It is just going to run over that tuft. So that is one clue for you to remember. So in this one, whenever you are tracking the GBM, you don't see the rupture of the GBM. That is what you mean. You are seeing a separation in between the two tuft, but still the GBM is intact. In crescent, you don't see that intact. Now, I just want to, this is how I teach the fellows. I think I, it might be wrong about this. Uh, you can correct me, but um, rupture of the GBM and then like the, the parietal epithelial cells or whatever starts to try to go in and put the fire out. And that's like a crescent. That's how I think about it. Is that wrong or? No, you, you can definitely say that because first stage is the rupture of the GBM, fibrinoid necrosis. And then it is just completely covered by the crescent and the crescent comes and ends up damaging the underlying glom completely. But, but that, it's like trying to put the fire because you can't have this, this GBM that's ruptured in there. It's a bad, bad thing. <laughs> you are absolutely right. That's why the okay. urgency in treatment, because if you don't stop that, the crescent is going to just run over the complete glom and it cannot repair itself. It's like a high rise building in New York City on fire and you got to put it out. And it's, yes. it's, a, it's a tough thing to do. I agree right. with you. Cool. Mm -hmm. And EM is going to be the same, right? Electron microscopy, depending on the type of collapse, you might or might not end up seeing a uh, complete foot process effacement or widespread foot process effacement, okay? Shri, Shri can you go back for a second? Um, yeah. Are there any protein droplets there that you can point out? Yeah. So this one, my arrow, can you see the mouse? This uh, is a protein yeah, resorption drop. Okay, great. Those round pink things are protein resorption droplets. And that's key also because they can kind of look like a red cell, but on PAS, the red cells are negative. So those are abnormal little yep. thingamajigs mm -hmm. to be very okay. precise in my terminology. Yeah. Terminology, we all can decide our own. So when you talk to other people, terminology is important. But if I'm a fellow, if I want to learn something, I can have my own language. You know, language is important when two people talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. So can you not can you not see red blood cell casts on PAS? It's difficult, right? A pathologist will suspect that. A pathologist can see it. Like, but are you uh, saying that you have, you a have nephrologist like, cannot? You have like Batman vision or something? <laughs> No, because we are habituated of seeing it so much, right? So we will end up picking it Very up. Cool. Then we will confirm that on the... So this is a classical exam slide, which you might end up getting collapsed. But I just wanted to show you it is a spectrum. Collapse, many students end up thinking, hey, I'm thinking about FSGS when I'm thinking about collapse. Now this looks like collapse. I can see the balloon that's just got, you know, like you poked it and... It's shriveled into a uh, you know little spot like that really shows well on this uh, stain, silver stain. Yes, you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So, Sri, there is a question about why are protein droplets PAS positive when they're not carbohydrate? I don't know the answer for that. Uh, Arun, <laughs> all right, Arun, you you win. You stump Sri. <laughs> Does that mean you get a free Arcana Lab mug? <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, and that really the protein drop would show up even nicer on this one too. Yes. Is, uh, what is this stain for the for everybody? Silver. If you want to put it <clears> because it's a dark, it's a silver uh, it was, stain. That, that, it was for the chat, Shree. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shree's like, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, nice. This is really good. I'm learning so much here. Shree, I don't know if you know Manisha, but uh, she's saying that you used to make a face during fellowship sucking your cheeks in. Yes, that for collapse, right? Like it's very easy to imagine that like collapse when you have to imagine how it will look like. Just imagine someone has sucked out the entire blood out of the glomerular tuft <clears throat> and you can just put your checks in and that is how you will know your morphology. Now these red cells are showing up nicely on this silver stain. Yes. Look at those red cells. Yeah, they're looking uh, very nice. Yeah. So what is the purpose? What did I do just now? Is this a new new case or a same yeah, case? Yeah, this is a new case. <clears throat> oh, okay. Got it. Got it. I think anytime, anytime, and make I, anytime I, I think of silver stain on a board test, it is silver. It's going to be membranous. So why do you think this is membranous? Sometimes you can't have a right answer for the wrong reasons, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> Your answer is absolutely right, but can you tell me why? Well, these little dots that are appearing kind of right in there where your yeah your pointer is. Um, yes. Can you see those dots? That's a really good area. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. And you see that? The GBM is thick, and you can see the vacuoles in the GBM. So you know you are dealing with something. So to make a diagnosis, you have to look at your immunofluorescent so this was the silver i ended up showing you a silver stain pla2r all the way to the bank okay and i will show you the same uh, case on a pas stain so that you can appreciate how a member the red cells will go away here you the red cells the are going to go away nicely yeah Next, us went away. So since we are talking about red cells, let's see if Sorry, they are Shree, can you go back to the silver for one second and point out again the silver? spikes yeah, Spikes I will do that. The... Really small little. I will do that. I will do that right away. So this is and the HNA. There is a request to zoom on the spikes if you can. Yeah, spikes. I have to see. This is an early memory. I might not have spikes on this one, but I will check. But that red blood cell question on the PAS, you were not able to see it, but on HNA, you can see it. So that is your indirect evidence that, yes, you are dealing with it. And let me go back to the silver and let me see if I can find spikes. Remember, we got an hour and a half, so we're doing really well. We're trying to learn together. Yeah, perfect. So in this one, you can see the vacuoles very easily. Can you see that? And my, right now, my arrow is right there. And this is the, in the tangential cuts, you can see the vacuoles. And over here, in, in this one, you can see spikes. Yeah. I see them. Can you see that spikes yeah. over here? The dark, the deposits in, is in between and the GBMs are projecting. And you can even see the deposits on your trichrome stain. So all the stains which we do routinely in kidney biopsy are helpful. And each one of them gives you a story, you know? Can you see the red stuff in the, on the GBM on top of the GBM? Little trichrome, huh? Getting fancy. Yeah, trichrome. So can you see the 
red red thing yep. on the top of blue so that. the gvm yeah. is blue on top of it there is something red dots yeah. yeah so the red thing is the they are the deposits basically so you can pick it up so they are known as fucinophilic deposits and you can see them so the, on the biopsy itself you ended up predicting hey i'm dealing with deposits so give me the if and em don't waste my time you know so you will make a diagnosis right away. So I want you all to remember this image in your mind. This is a very classical image for a membranous. Granular global IgG deposits. And in this one, it is positive for kappa lambda, C3 trace. And this is what you see as vacuoles and as spikes on light microscopy. This dark stuff are the deposits. This light gray stuff is the normal GBM color on the EM. Anything which is darker than that is the electron dense deposits. And in the membranous, you will see that initially depositing on the surface of the GBM. And then gradually what happens, GBM reacts to it. Okay, that's why the spikes are forming. And gradually as the disease is going to progress, the GBM is going to completely encircle those deposits. You know, And as the disease is going to progress further, the deposits are going to get resolved. You know? At few places, the deposits are going to get resolved. So that is what you see on your light microscopy and on different stains. Are you all comfortable with EM of membranous? Can you make a diagnosis now? So Matt wanted PLA2R on this one, right? So we have to give him PLA2R. So this is PLA2R. So this is a PLA2R positive case. So I wanted to show you this image because any gen, anything antibody which we are detecting, we can detect it either through immunohistochemistry or we can detect it on the IF. So you can look at it even on the IF, immunofluorescence. So many centers are going to have immunofluorescence for PLA2R. So this is the second case of membranous which I wanted to show you. Same, uh, IF, and you can see the deposits. They are different morphology, a lot of sub-epithelial deposits, you know, and they're just on the surface. Can you appreciate those deposits? In the last case, when I showed you the deposits, you were looking at the deposits, they were a little deeper into the GBM. In this one, they're very superficial in the GBM. Can you all appreciate that? GBM is thick, and on the outer surface, there are a lot of deposits. Thank you for including that red cell in there. And this one is positive for THS D7A. So now, ton of antigens have been described. I'm not going to go over all the antigens, but I just wanted to show you the list to see what can be asked. So you can, every, like most of the articles are, I have seen are available easily. I just Google up so you can see that. But there are ton and ton of antigens which have been described, okay? So there's there a question. A quest oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just said there's a question about differentiating different types of uh, these deposits in um, set of thelal deposits, how do you uh, differentiate from other diseases? And, and maybe you'll get to that towards the end when you really talk about it. So you cannot make a diagnosis of a disease on EM. You are making a diagnosis by putting together your light IF and EM points. You have to have everything together. Everything together. Because so it any could look like, uh, if you just do EM, it's going to look like anything. Yes, uh, any, any disease which has sub-epithelial deposit is going to look exactly like that. So you cannot make a diagnosis only on EM. So EM is basically telling you, hey, you have deposits in this particular area. In IgA, you will have mesangium. In membranous, you are going to have sub-epithelial. C3 also is going to have sub-epithelial. So infection, lupus, everything will have sub-epithelial. Yeah? So you don't make a diagnosis on EM. It is helpful. But you bring together your light and IF findings and EM together, then make a diagnosis. But if you learn basic principles, you can apply that anywhere. So the basic principle from the EM was that electron dense deposits is going to be darker than the GVM. If I know that, show me any image, I will pick up electron dense deposits. You know, so that will be the take home message. So understand, if you understand the basic principles, you can apply that to any image or any disease which you see. Okay. Um, when you're when you're thinking about PLA two R staining, do you care if it's um, immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence? No. Yeah, it can be anything. Depending from the lab to lab, you can develop on your own. Yeah, every lab can do it in a different way. Yeah. So I'm showing you one more case. Okay. So can you give me your diagnosis on this one? So somebody has said membranous. 
I, uh, have I gone crazy? I'm just not go moving beyond membranous here. <laughs> so another you, for membranous. So, so okay, I saw the multiple votes for membranous. So I'm showing you, as I said, you have to bring together everything. So I'm showing you the IF for this case, and I want you to diagnose this for me. IF everything, G M C one Q kappa lambda, everything looks like it. So do you think IF is positive or negative? Negative nice. Perfect. Negative. Yes, because I have shown you already the positive IS. So you know how that looks like. So I'm now really confused. Light microscopy is looking like membranous. I ended up showing you the IF, which is negative. I am really confused. So now on the last question, show me the EM. I want to see whether the deposits are present or not. I ended up showing you the EM. So on the light microscopy, what we suspected was membranous. And on the EM, can you see those dark stuff? And the basic, this is the normal color of the GBM and I can see dark deposits. So I definitely have deposits, but unfortunately my IF is negative. So what will I do? What will I do? I will take the paraffin tissue and I'm going to perform immunofluorescence on that. So in this case, the immunofluorescence, which was performed on the paraffin tissue ends up showing you IgG kappa. So in this case, it is positive for IgG kappa and lambda is negative, okay? So this disease, which looks like membranous, is known as membranous-like glomerulopathy with masked, because you ended up unmasking the IgG on IF. That's why with masked IgG kappa deposits, this is the name of the entity. In <laughs> nutshell, if I have to ever make a diagnosis in this one, the most common clinical presentation is, the patients are normally young female. They present with vague autoimmune phenomena and you cannot classify them into a well-defined disease category. Like you won't be able to classify your patient into systemic lupus erythematosus. So you'll be really like struggling with it. When you do a biopsy, it will look like that. Last year, there was a specific marker which was described for this entity. It is serum amyloid protein or SAP the gloms are positive for SAP. So you can make a specific diagnosis of membranous like mass glomerulopathy if SAP is positive. And this was the visual abstract, which just tells you how we ended up coming up with the conclusion. But SAP is a marker. If SAP is positive, you can easily make a diagnosis of membranous like mass glomerulopathy now, with IgG kappa sure, deposit. I'm just gonna bring us down uh, out of orbit for a little bit. Um, sure. Why should a nephrologist know this? Seems like this is something a pathologist needs to know. And if I'm telling a pathologist, hey, this could be masked, you need to do a paraffin IF, uh, is that happen? It depends on where you practice. Because see, some of the cases of triple MG can be C3 positive only initially, right? Well, I'm so, just saying like, for, this is a, a kind of a board review prep. Why would a nephrologist need to uh, unmask uh, something so that should be a standard approach for pathology. So if I'm asking for the board perspective, I'll give you that question. So for the board, for my hint is either this will be SAP positive or it was diagnosed after unmasking it. That is how as a nephrologist, I will get it. But for a pathologist, many people are not aware of this. So if the C3 is positive initially- so pathologists are not aware of this. No, no, but many places won't do paraffin IF because initially you might end up diagnosing this entity as C3 only. Can you explain why the, the paraffin IF, like why does it unmask it in a- We don't know the exact that? cause for this one. No, we don't know the exact reason why it unmasks. It doesn't stain properly. There are several hypotheses with it. Like the when we do the paraffin processing, the antigens are in a different way. They end up unmasking in that way, but we don't know the exact etiology, like why it unmasks on paraffin and not on the routine. So you've been stumped twice already today. It's not even 11 o'clock yet. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, pathologists don't have out. all the answers, Samira. That's why we work together. Like nephrologists and pathologists have to act together, you know? So, so, so do you think that we should do paraffin on all IF negative stains? No, not, not all. You have to have suspicion. So in this case, if I have to do... So any case of C3GN, when you make a diagnosis, like C3 glomerulopathy, you should do a paraffin IF before making that diagnosis. Because in a young age, you will make a diagnosis of membranous like mass glomerulopathy with IgG, kappa or lambda deposits. That is the disease entity which you'll make. And 
there are some more disease entities which end up unmasking like para proteins will unmask sometimes they are negative on the routine if but when you do the paraffin if they will unmask so para protein or mgrs might end up unmasking and sometimes some routine cases of cryo cryo gn they are negative absolutely on the routine if and then they end up unmasking on the paraffin if so it depends on the scenario so it's you cannot say that i will i will go ahead and do paraffin if on all the cases it depends on the morphology if and clinical picture so if i'm dealing say with a 70 year old male diagnosed with kappa light chain and i'm seeing a proliferation and my routine if was negative i'm going to do a paraffin if similarly same history if you if i look at a biopsy and that shows acute tubular injury i'm going to do a paraffin if because sometimes kappa is known to unmask okay so again we are going into details which are not very classical or high yield so we will take a back seat and move something which is very classical now and which can be a question and someone did ask me that question earlier okay so yeah can you all see that image yes yes what is the diagnosis Uh, someone has oh, put sorry, in yeah. light, light chain deposition disease, collapsing glomerulopathy. And anyone else want to? Nodular glomerular sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Could be diabetes. Good. Very good differential. The differential, which I love, like the exact differential should be this is a nodular glomerular sclerosis. And show me the other markers to make a diagnosis and to, uh, for a specific diagnosis, right? So I have to show you IF on this one to ask for a definitive diagnosis. And the IF is this one. So now, did you get your diagnosis? We got kappa restriction. So we got a monoclonal um, process. So we have a light chain deposition disease in the Perfect. Top. Perfect. Yes. So you can make a diagnosis of light chain deposition disease once you look at the IF and EM. On light microscopy, you cannot make that diagnosis. On a light microscopy, you can just say this is nodular glomerular sclerosis, and I need IF and EM to make a diagnosis, okay? Because it can be diabetes also. And EM is, again, very important to make a diagnosis of LCDD. <clears throat> can you appreciate the TBM? This is a tubular basement membrane. These are the glomerular basement membrane. You can see a lot of deposits here, and this is a high power. So this is a TBM. TBM is thick, and you can see a lot of powdery granular deposits here. Let me show you another image. This one. Can you appreciate the deposits over here in the TBM? Looks like sand. Uh, Almost like know. sand. Yes, you are abs uh, absolutely like, like a granular punctate deposits on the TBM. This is a classical EM image. I can give you this image and ask you a question on LCDD. You know, like... As I said, IF was good. That was important. That was needed to make a diagnosis. So is that a, a sand of uh, immunoglobulin? Light chain, because kappa. Because light in this chain, case, we know the kappa is positive. Beautiful light chain sand beach. Yes. <laughs> so again, <clears throat> Matt, going back to the discussion, I, EM alone cannot help you to make a diagnosis. Like immunoglobulins, everything is going to look like electron-dense deposits. So you always need to go back to your IF to see what was the nature of that deposit. So in this case, you already know from your IF that it is kappa. So you know it is a kappa light chain deposition disease. Okay. You all ended up imbibing this image? Yeah. One of the things that I think it's hard for people to look at EMs is I'm immediately drawn to all those white holes everywhere, like Swiss cheese. Like I'm looking yeah. at, like I, and, and I'm, I'm not going to the basic membrane. Like what, what the world's all that stuff? Yeah. Is that just like stuff to confuse people? No, that is experience, Matt. Like when you give me a patient, I will be all over the place, right? Yeah. <laughs> the patient is having that, patient is having that. Uh, it's kind of like have... when you're looking at a piece of artwork at a museum, I'm like, that's beautiful. And they're like, I'm looking at the wrong area. <laughs> yeah. So this comes with practice because see, when you show me this image, I'm not looking anywhere else except the TVM. 
you know, because I know. Then I will look at everything else. Okay, this patient has tubular injury, so I'm uh, seeing a lot of uh, stuff and that. Well, forget about it. Let's focus on TVM. So gradually we get habituated. So that's why, like, as a fellow, just get habituated of looking at the TVM and the deposits. So Ruth in is asking a good question. What in the world a normal TVM looks like? I'll show you. I, I hope I have some. I Normally, there are not a lot of... So I mean, I think mm, I count on my hand how many tubular... Yeah, I agree. That's, there are not a lot like of diseases which would involve TBM. And from the examination perspective, I cannot think of any other disease you will get, which I'm quick. I can phrase a question on EM for TBM. You know? So if I have to phrase one question on TBM from the examination perspective, it will be LCD day. Okay. Uh, now, as, I, as soon as I said that, I said TBM, so I, it was good. Because I can phrase one more question on tubules. Like, remember tenofovir toxicity? If I have to ask you a question on abnormal mitochondria, I can ask that. And in that case, I will give you a proximal tubular image and I will show you abnormal mitochondria. But that will be for tenofovir toxicity. And I'll give you a history of HIV and all that. Okay. Okay. LCDD. So I have a <clears throat> next image and I think you are going to get it. You don't need anything else. Get that. Remember the PAS uh, in this one. All right. So CAS nephropathy. Several yes. people. <clears throat> yeah, this is CAS nephropathy. This is how CAS are going to look like. So when I showed you. Over that. Yeah. So other images where we thought it might be a cast nephropathy, forget about it. So they were not cast nephropathy. Can you see this? Bunch of cast, cellular reaction, and they're completely PS negative or PS fail. You know, like you can see the cellular reaction. Again, but this is a diagnosis which you make. Confirm that you made it on light microscopy, but you will confirm what kind of restriction is there. So this cast over here is negative for kappa, but when I ended up staining it for lambda, it is strongly positive. So is that all? Anything else you can see? In this, anything else which I'm missing out? Um, Somebody said coexisting LCDD. Man, do we have pathologists? <laughs> <laughs> Our audience is rocking today. I'm so happy. Yeah, yes, there is really LCDD. Nice. And confirmed it on the EM. So remember the granular deposits which I ended up showing you? Can you appreciate that? The same punctate deposits are seen over here. Oh, love Beautiful. those red cells. You know that you're in the, yeah. in the capillary loop there. Yeah. You can see those, look, those podocytes are looking pretty good. Yeah. Podocytes are looking pretty good in this yeah, one. Yeah, but that uh, basement membrane has got some sandy beaches there too. I agree with you. So you ended up making a combo diagnosis in this one, light chain cast nephropathy and LCDD on this one. So since we are in the paraprotein category and that was a hint for you to make a diagnosis on this one because you ended up making a diagnosis of light chain cast nephropathy. So what do you think this is? I'm showing you only tubules again. So it has to be a question on the tubules. So the hint for you is that any other disease which you know will involve the tubules and morphologically, it will look like this. So what is the morphological look which I am trying to point out? This is a PAS stain. The TBMs are pink. And the tibules, you asked me the question. The protein They're very graphic, pink. Uh, too homogenous looking. I'm not lying. And very that. pale. Yeah, They're very right? pale. They were like not they're very sickly looking. Yeah, very tubules. sickly looking, right? You are absolutely right. So they're not normal. This person basically. might have Fanconi syndrome. Man, you all are rocking today. Yes. See, this patient has on immunofluorescence, the tubules are positive for kappa. In the and tubules. In the tubules. Get that stuff out of there. Amazing, right? And I was telling you, kappa is notorious for unmasking on paraffin. See the extent of positivity on the routine and the extent of positivity on the paraffin. The extent hmm. of positivity ended up increasing a lot on paraffin, you know? I'm, I'm becoming more and more just, I'll just do paraffin for all. I agree with... Uh... 
You're gonna right. you're gonna do that, Matt. You're gonna go to the lab and do that. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to show you crystals on oh, tall Fabrice. Blood. This one. That's not, that's not Fabrice. Is oh, it? I love it. Say that. I love it. No, those are the rhomboids in LCPT. <laughs> oh, gosh, you're right. This is the scout image from the EM, I thought. No, I love what you said. Because, see, in our mind, what we are trying to do today is to develop those triggers, right? So, if I so, show you the tall blue and the structures like that, Fabre is the immediate thing which jumps to our mind, right? Yeah. But this is not Fabre. So, if I have to frame. Toluene oh, blue is what this is. This is tall, tall, blue. This is blue. what you and like, uh, you, you cut the. Uh, it's a EM, thick section, right? Yes, thick section for EM. And you can, yeah, then you put it in. The and EM. these are the crystals. You are absolute. Can, you, can yeah. you go higher power to see the rhomboid shape or no? Uh, no, or is this, this is, uh, uh, I didn't realize. This is, um, uh, what will I say, PowerPoint. So, oh, okay, I, okay. Yeah, I won't be able to zoom and yeah but this are rhomboid you can appreciate the structure right here Samir. like if you look at the individual crystals so it's light chains again light chain and you will see crystals so that was the beauty of it okay so you were able to see crystals on that and fabrice go back for a second there was a, a question about the location of the deposits um for uh gvm versus tubular can you tell the difference between light chain deposition disease and light chain cast nephropathy based on where they are or can they be in either place? Yeah, cast, yes. So your question is difference between light chain cast nephropathy and LCPT or LCDD? LCDD in the location of those powdery deposits. Got it. LCDD, yes, the location of the powdery deposits is within the GVM over here. And you can see that on the TBM also, like over here. So you can see that either in the TBM on, and the GVM both, you will see it. And the nature of the deposits will give it away that you are dealing with LCDD. And you already are suspecting LCDD because you looked at your IF. So you, you don't see those deposits if it's only cast nephropathy? No, you don't see that. Just in cast in nephropathy, you won't see the deposits. If you see the deposits, you will make a combined diagnosis of cast nephropathy and LCDD. Ruth, does that answer your question? Okay. Does great. that answer the question? Yes. Okay, so I would like to uh, switch to spotters basically. And this terminology ended up coming from where I did my residency uh, multiple years back, back in India. Every Friday we, we used to get a quiz and we were asked to make a diagnosis only on that slide or on that particular image without any history or without any other details. That means they're very, very classical. So I would like to spend some time and I'll give you 10 seconds only per image to type your answer. And the images are so classical, you don't need anything else. So give me your diagnosis. So on this one, if I show you just this image, what is your diagnosis? Anti-GBM. Perfect. No other differential. Yeah. This one. Memberness. Perfect. No other differential. It is memberness. Depending on what type, whether it's lupus, routine, you are going to get other factors to get that answer. But this pattern is membranous. This pattern is linear, IgG, anti-GVM. So we'll keep that. Can you, can you describe the membranous pattern? Yeah. So this is granular because granular, that means like sand, what uh, Matt described, like powdery. Can, you can see those small dots together. So they are present on the GVM. Can you see those small dots? So they are granular. The entire glomerular capillary wall is involved granular, global, entire glom is involved, and capillary wall. Granular, global, glomerular capillary wall. That is IgG, and that is membranous. This is linear glomerular capillary wall, and you don't see the granularity. See the smoothness? So this is anti-GBM, and this is membranous. Nice. In this one, I don't need a diagnosis. IgA. Oh, perfect. You got it. But... I wanted to show you, if I say this is an IgA image, you will get an IgA, but this is a classical mesangial location because I see sometimes fellow get confused on the location of the deposits. This is the capillary wall deposits. You can see the deposits in the periphery. This is the mesangial location and IgA is the classical example, very classical example, IgA. And this one, if I show you the montage, I have only one diagnosis. Tell me a disease which can show any of the IF picture, like if I have a disease, what is that disease? That can show any of those patterns. Everybody says lupus. 
Exactly. Almost everyone. Yeah. Yes, I agree. This is the lupus. You can have granular, you have subendothelial, and this is the beauty of this image. As I said in the membranous, you see those granular deposits in the subendothelial. Can you appreciate the smoothness of the outline? Those outlines are very smooth. So this is subendothelial deposits. So this is lupus. You can practically see deposits everywhere. And this is a classical lupus, which you read in the description. You have TBM deposits. You have vessel wall deposits. This is the tissue ANA pattern. This is the that's how all the light, lighting up the uh, the nucleus of each yes. of the cells. So whenever we see a lupus, this is how we see the staining within the tubular interstitial compartment. You don't see a lot. It is not discussed a lot. But in lupus, you will see that. What is the diagnosis on this one? Again, a very classical image. Hint, if I give you a hint, you will get it. Hint is a transplant. So somebody said C4D? Yes, this is diffuse C4D positivity in a transplant. These are the C4D stain, and these are the peritubular capillaries. You can see the tubules, and these are the peritubular capillaries, which are staining. One diagnosis for this image. Calcium oxalate. Perfect. This is a polarized microscopy. Sorry, can you go back to the transplant for a second and tell us what the diagnosis is for? This is diffuse C4D positivity. So you are most likely dealing with the AMR. You have to have other findings of AMR, like microcirculation inflammation, glomerulitis. But IF-wise, this is diffuse C4D positivity. Thanks. And this is oxalate nephropathy. So this is a polarized image. In the background, you are seeing the renal parenchyma and the polarized deposits are the oxalate deposits. And this is a classical image. And I was telling initially that sometimes I have seen uh, fellows getting confused with collapse and crescent. This is one scenario. So this is a classical crescent. I'm and looking I was talking for a GBM that's uh, broken. See this one over here, Matt, can you see that? Yeah, I'm tracking this GBM. It's right okay. broken right here. I, you know, like after you show me, um, I, but how about that bottom part right there? I see like some, some just like hanging out. Yes. No, this no, one. No, no. Keep to the left. To the left. No, no, no. And the same. Yeah. Yeah. You see how it like, yeah. they just like stick out and don't, and don't go anywhere. Is that a good example? Yeah, that is a GBM rupture. So we got to get the fire trucks and yes. yeah, fire trucks are that. Yeah. And see, this one is so bad that crescent has taken over the entire top. But this is like, is this like abnormally broken? Like, I've never seen this much broken. GBM. Yeah. So again, so now if I have to ask you a question, you are seeing crescents. Your entire biopsy looks like it. What are you going to think? Cyclophosphamide deficiency. Yeah, that is treatment. I'm in pathology. That is not my <laughs> field, man. <laughs> yeah. So give me the diagnosis, though. Like you can always, as a pathologist, we love to guess, you know. So if I have people to make are saying one, anti GBM, perfect. That is absolutely right because if GBMs I GBMs are under a lot of stress here. Yeah, but that is not the reason though. <laughs> so I said if all the glands looks exactly like that, because see, all the glands are showing you acute crescentic disease process. You think anti GBM because it's very sudden. If you see crescents of different ages, like some are cellular, some are fibrocellular, some are fibrous, then you think about anchor. anchor. Yep. So in this one, if you tell me all the glomps are looking like that, they are practically run over by the fire trucks. So anti-GBM is just like, bam, all yes. of them exactly the same age. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, okay. So you Perfect. suspect that anti-GBM. Again, diagnosis on this one. And there are a lot of hints in this images. Like this is a beautiful hint right here. This is the silver stain. So TMA, vasculitis, or some <clears throat> of the things in the chat. Okay. So vasculitis. Can you tell us which of these stains are too while we're at it? Yeah, this is uh, HNE. Okay. This is also HNE. This is trichrome, and this is silver. And this is necrotizing arthritis, vasculitis, I can take it. This is not TMA because I don't see fibrin. The necrosis is involving the wall of the wall, the wall of the blood vessel, you know? The necrosis is involving the wall of the blood vessel. If I would have seen fibrin within the lumen, I would have called it as a TMA, thrombotic microangiopathy. In this case, I, don't, I cannot see the wall. 
the wall is dissolved by the fibrinoid necrosis. So this is necrotizing arthritis or vasculitis, okay? Most common cause in the native scenario is anchor. Maybe it'd be good to show us a wall. Wall, this is the, <clears throat> so over here, you cannot like see the wall. The artery yeah, like, is completely gone. One. This is the normal one. Oh, that side is. Yeah, ah. left side is the normal vascular wall. Okay. And you can see in comparison, the right side is completely gone. It is fibrinoid necrosis. And the way you make the diagnosis on this one, see the residual wall is left in the trichrome below. I see. And so this part, part of it's gone. And, yes, and part of it's left. There. And this red thing, okay. Like red blood cells, fibrin I sure is the right. I hope they don't put this on the board exam. But this is easy though, right? Oh like, yeah, very easy. Yeah, necrotizing arthritis is <laughs> easy. easy. Yeah. What is the what is the top right image? This is also necrotizing arthritis. <clears throat> See the blood vessel? It's completely gone. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I need a diagnosis, a pattern on this one. You might you don't give me a disease. <clears throat> Give me a pattern. Uh, so everybody's saying MPGN. Cauliflower. <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah. I, yeah, I want you all to get this. Yeah, definitely. This is MPGN, no doubt about it. Because the glom is lobular. It is showing you proliferation. A lot of mononuclear cells. GBM duplication on the silver stain. And some highland droplets, right? So... Fellow wise, I'm first of all, my differential is going to be cryo because of the highland deposits, right? MPGN pattern. But I don't want a diagnosis from you here. To make a diagnosis for MPGN, you will have a clinical history and you will have an IF depending on what is positive. Is it full house? Is it staining for only few stains or is it C3 only? So depending on that, you can make a diagnosis. But morphologically, as long as you're picking up MPGN, we are good. This is again a very classical image. And you have to have only one diagnosis for that. And remember, we can see those red cells. So it is a what stain? H&E stain. Well, not for you. I learned it, man. Oh, no, I know it. <laughs> you can't, you just can't help yourself. So we have a vote for TMA, a few votes for that. Perfect. So what was the other vote, Samina? Nope, just TMA. Yeah, this is TMA, classical TMA, because you have mucointimal edema, you have fibrin within the, so remember this fibrin was involving the wall earlier. And right now you are seeing that fibrin within the intima. And you can see the fragmented red cells on this it's one. It's hard for me to tell it's the intima. Uh, because it's this like is the, the wall. the edge of the wall though. Okay, so yeah. there's like something beyond it. Yeah, the color is changing, right? So a pathologist, they love colors. So over here, see deep pink, this is the muscle. And as I'm going inside, the color is fading. It's more like a, light bluish, whitish, you know? Uh, so this is intima. This is a swollen in edema. Is it actually obliterating the lumen? Yes, it is actually obliterating the lumen. <clears throat> and over here also, it is actually obliterating the lumen. Someone's so mentioning you, fragmented red cells. Is that something you're seeing? Yeah, you can see that. See the lumen is completely obliterated here. Can you see the small red, red dots? Mm -hmm. yep. They are all fragmented red cells. You can see that within the intima. Mm. Wow. And just imagine how fast the fibrosis is going to progress in this patient, you know, because you have deprived the kidney of its blood supply. You have occluded the lumen. Your kidney is not going to get the blood supply. So your patient is going to progress to like towards the CKD5 or end stage very fast in this patient, depending on how long this continues. But the kidney is completely deprived of the blood supply. Yeah, is this a trichrome of that process? This is trichrome. This is PAS. This is silver, and this is HNA. Like I wouldn't be able to see the wall of those uh, vessels that you just showed with TMA. You should still see yeah. that with trichrome, right? Yeah, you can see that. And this is the same glomerular compartment I'm showing you the TMA on different stains: trichrome, PAS, silver, and HNA. This is a lot to take in. Okay, I'm trying to. This is a lot. What's happening right here? Oh, okay. I thought I'm good. I'm just warming up right now, man. You're just warming up. <laughs> hey, you gotta, hey we're, we're trying to feed these uh, small uh, nephrology brains here. Come on, Matt. <laughs> so, oh, yes, I love this. You know, you that can I imagine, and someone says it cholesterol embolism. And so, this, the processing of the, of the cholesterol dissolves it and it leaves yeah. in its place where it used to sit. Is that yeah, right? I agree with you completely. You got it. Hey, you should do pathology. 
Oh, Six months pathology, and I think you'll be good to sign up. <laughs> so I wanted to show you some EMs, very classical EMs, because I see <clears throat> sometimes, as Matt said, if RBC is not there, we end up getting confused how to... Well, tell them about the RBC thing. Just tell, yeah. tell them about it. Where yeah. is so, it and why do you want to do it? Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a low-power image of a glon, okay? So I, the way I am orient myself, this is the mesangium, and this is the glomerular basement membrane, and this is the capillary lumen. Those dark things are the red blood cells. And the area outside the glomerular capillary wall is the Bowman's space. And these are the podocytes which are present outside, okay? So in an exam, most likely you will get mesangium, you will get glomerular capillary wall abnormality. So let's see some of the examples which you can be asked, okay? And this is a high power image of the GBM just to show you how the intact photocyte processes I mean, look like. That's just the like thing, if you have photocytes like that, you don't need a red cell. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. So <laughs> that is how you orient yourself. This is outside aspect, this is the GBM, and this is the capillary lumen. And this is the normal, remember this color, like the grayish color, depending on where the EM was processed, the color might be variable, but this is the normal density, you know? So like in radiology, we describe things in terms of density. Similarly, electron dense deposits, we are calling it, okay? So this is the normal color, and this is the normal podocyte. They are all standing like fingers, okay? So this is the example of, Example of, what is it? Pink. Lots of de uh, deposits there. Um, In the location? It yeah, you got like it. A, a epithelial got it. because perfect, not perfect, perfect. red cell. <clears throat> yeah, so this fulfills all our criteria. We can orient our cells because of the red cells, the capillary loop are there, and we can see deposits on the top of the GBM. That's why the location is sub-epithelial. Exactly. If the deposits were located below the GBM, we would have called it sub-endothelial, okay? This is sub-epithelial. Most many likely- people did not do nephrology because of those two names? Sub-epithelial and- it, that, that was so confusing in medical school, you know? I agree with that. Like, it took a, a solid several decades for me to get that down. Yeah, <laughs> but that is easy. So if anyone wants to join nephrology scared is because, and is scared because of that, send them to me. I can motivate them. Okay. And what do you see here? A lot of foot process effacement and some GBM irregularity over here, right? I can suspect something is wrong with the GBM, but I cannot make a diagnosis yet, okay? I can make foot process effacement, but the GBMs don't look normal. Hey, Shri, you showed me normal GBMs earlier, but over here, they just don't look normal. So show me high power. So that is the question you will ask. So in this one, I can show you this image and I can see the GBM abnormality right here, the irregularity and the lamellation over here. But again, it might be difficult for you. So I will give you a high power image over here. Can you see that? The GBM abnormality, it is not normal. The texture I had shown you earlier was normal. And over here, the GBM is very thin. You can see the polar side. Basket weaving? Are we basket weaving yes, here? Yes, yes, We are again dealing with the case of hereditary nephritis. And this is a you real- know, but I needed you to push, push, push the envelope on that. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> you know? And this one is again very classical. I don't think you need anything. Give me a diagnosis on this one. Anybody? You don't need anything on this one. Thin basement membrane. Perfect, right? So images, like there are some images are classical. You don't, I don't need to give you GBM thickness. So you on don't this want me to be out there measuring things. Yeah I, yeah, I agree with you. So that's why like this is thin GBM for everyone, right? And this is the another image for thin GBM. You can get- So there, there's a question about how do you differentiate this from Alport? So yes, in Alport also you can see segmental GBM thinning. You have to yeah, look at textual abnormalities. right here. Yeah, yeah this can be Alport. So you have to look at the rest of the- You need, uh, you need standing global. for collagen, I think. And look at the rest of this the- could yeah. be, This could be Alport. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, this could be Alport. Yeah, I agree. And, and can you comment on the podocytes here? There's a question about that. Yeah, they're effaced. The podocytes are gone. They're effaced. So one thing I wanted to <clears throat> bring attention to the fellows, for every image, there is a main character and there are side characters. You remember in a movie also, whenever they are showing a movie, our attention always goes on the main character of that particular scene. You always focus on that. 
Similarly, gradually, as you learn more and more kidney pathology, you will always go back to the main character. And the peripheral characters are going to play the role. You know, they are going to do their own stuff. Like the TBM, which Matt brought up. In that image, TBM is the main character. The rest of the things are going on in the background. You don't have to focus on that. Similarly, in this one, the GBM is the main thing which I'm going to focus on. The rest of the things are going on in the background. They are important, but for the pathologist, for the nephrology fellow, you asked me a question, I'm going to give you an answer. And the answer most of the time is very straightforward. You know, I'm not going to ask you a combination. I'm going to show you a thin GBM, then show you a bunch of deposits. And so I would like to make a have to learn to ignore looking at a lot of stuff. Yes. Ignoring is very important. I agree with you. That red cell is messed up, but I like it being there. Yeah, I wanted to show you an EM, just a messed up image, you know, like not a very classical one, but this is normal. You know, like mesangem is okay, you are seeing the red blood cells because you're all habituated of looking at a classical image, you know, capital loop. But in real life, it might not be classical. But again, I can give you this image. I see deposits. Where? This one? I don't know, right in there, yeah. That's a positive. Yeah, mesangem is a little dense. Yeah, so this might be a diabetes because little bit of density is okay. This is the, not like electron dense, but you have to, if you are really confused in real life, you can go back to the IF and just prove IF is negative on that one. And in this one, there, just, there are some vague densities. This might be a diabetic. In diabetic, you might end up seeing some densities. And I wanted to show you like in the hereditary nephritis, some of us were confused how the lamellation, this is the routine texture of the GBM. Can you see that evenness of the- No basket. Nothing, no, no basket, that evenness of the GBM is there. And this is again, a good image, you know, like you can get a diagnosis just on that. And I medical is school- Is that an endothelial cell? Or is yeah, that this, is a, <clears throat> this is a leukocyte. You can see the granules leukocyte. of the leukocyte within the lumen. Oh. Remember in the medical school, we were really getting excited when you used to like sub epithelial hump shaped uh -oh. deposits. This is, so this is someone, that sub epithelial yep. hump shaped deposit. In this case, there are mesangial deposits Fetious also. GN. But again, it is not diagnostic of infection only. But I know, for exam purposes <clears throat> and routine life, whenever we talk, hey, did you see the sub epithelial hump shaped deposits? But it is not classical of infection only. You can see that in a bunch of other entities, even in C3G, you can see that. So this is a sub epithelial hump shaped deposits. Okay. Sorry, Shri, can you go back two images, the one with the normal basement membrane? There was a question about the podocytes. One more back. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on the podocytes here? They are effaced here. They're completely gone here. So normal GBM, podocytes gone. So no, no. So again, it is a context driven, right? So I'm not calling it as a normal GBM. I'm showing you this image to show you the texture of the GBM. Okay. There is photocyte foot process effacement here, but I cannot calculate a percentage of photocyte foot process effacement on this high power so image. So it's not like Alport's like, Yes, well, that is the main talking. point of showing you okay. that image. Hey, this is I not Alports. Yeah, Perfect. Alports, that texture was totally different. So contrast that image in your mind, you know, as compared to Alports, the GBM is going to look like it. Okay. Shri, just to give you some time, we have about 10 minutes to go. Yeah, I am pretty close. And this is again a very good image. And I have shown you an HNE on this one. Someone got Maybe the Maybe TMA? Man, you all are rocking well, today. Amazing the, job. The thing that, that it's really nice is you can see that the uh, podocytes are outside. So you're inside of a, of a cell, uh, uh -huh. capillary loop right there. Yeah. Uh, that's capillary loop. And you've oh, you, got, you figured that out without a red blood cell? Yeah. I mean, only because the, the uh, podocytes look good here. And oftentimes it don't. Uh -huh. So that's very helpful. So you made the diagnosis of TMA on the basis of this thing. GBM, below the GBM, we are in the subendothelial location. And this is a fluffy, fluffy material, you know, like, and that is TMA. Subendothelial fluff, which has accumulated in the subendothelial region. So this is TMA. Good job. Subendothelial fluff. Yeah, it is TMA. First so time now. To hear that. Yeah, and now I'm going to help you out in something classical. I have seen uh, fellows getting confused a lot. So fibrils, right? And I have seen fellows, they struggle a lot to remember the diameter of fibrils. Okay, so I'm going to show you three. And I will show you them in sequence so you will remo remember that. So I'll go back and forth between those three images. This is the first one. This is the second one. 
I will let you digest it and I will again come back. I'm not done with it, okay? And Can this we is just the- get a stain for DNA JB9 and forget about uh, the size? Yes. Yes, you are absolutely. That is the exact point I want to show you. <laughs> but in exam, you might end up getting a question. So I showed you three images back to back, amyloid 10, fibrillary 20, immunotactoid 30. Okay, that is an easy way of remembering it. 10, 20, 30. A comes before F, F, F comes after A, and I is after F. So that is, again, an easy way of remembering as a mnemonic. 10, 20, 30, AFI. You know? 10, 20, so 30, AFI. You know, like amyloid, fibrillary, and immunotactoid. So right when you go into the exam room, just write AFI 10, 20, 30 on that <laughs> little board they give you. But in practical life, we don't measure it. Just imagine, how can you measure the diameter of 10, those 10, 20, 30, fibers? AFI. Yeah. And it's, so this is amyloid fibrils, okay? The amyloid is going, are going to look like that. Fibrillary is a little thicker. You can appreciate the individual fibrils right here on the fibrillary. And immunotactoid is really thick. You don't need to just measure it. You will just know it's immunotactoid, okay? One thing I wanted to show you in a transplant scenario, peritubular capillary lamellation, you know? So you are in between, this is how the tubules look like. One of the questions was how the tubules look like. This is a tubules, how they look like. They might be a little thick depending on if there is a, you are scoping an area which has tubular atrophy or interstitial fibrosis or not. So this is a peritubular capillary and you can see a leukocyte within the PTC. And can you see those multiple lamellations? Can you see those layers of basement membranes? In the GBM, I showed you layers and this is the peritubular capillary. I'm showing you multiple layers. Can you see that? Yes. So this is PTC lamellation, which you see in chronic transplant, you know, the PTC lamellation, peritubular capillary lamellation. And Matt was waiting for this one. This is the... And you got, bodies, so it's probably someone with hydroxychloroquine <laughs> or febrase. Yes, definitely. But you um, got to remember the hydroxychloroquine because that's yes, you absolutely you. yes, I agree with you. That is the most common thing you have to remember. That Samir's and, post on Renal Fellow Network is uh, what was it? Not it's not always uh, zebras or something like that. I just pulled okay. up when you see zebra bodies, they commonly prescribed medications. Yes. Okay. So yes, I'm done. This was but the you last. You also can see it on the toluene blue, but they're not wrong. Yes, you it. can. You are absolutely right, Matt. You can see it. And that is your screening thing. As we discussed earlier, there are thick sections. So even before your EM comes out, you can see that. And yeah, you can see that both on tall blue as well as EM is pretty good. So this there's, there's, a, there's a question, Shri. Can you tell us what are zebra bodies? They are the inclusions within the myelinosomes, because there's a fabric, the patients have enzyme deficiency, though the inclusions are developing within the myelinosomes. And also, can you orient us on this EM? Where are we looking? You cannot looking? orient. This is a high power image of the podocyte. So like, there's no point in orienting, you know, because this image is so classical, but if you are really struggling, this will be the GBM, and these are the podocytes, and basically podocytes. Zebra bodies can accumulate a ton of places, but most of the time you are going to get a question on the podocytes itself. You know, they can Neurons accumulate. With, and yeah. A lot of different things. Yeah. So that's it. You know? Okay. Uh, Great. That was, any questions uh, or anything you all have? I uh, wanted to see um, the cholesterol uh, crystal tough uh, or cholesterol the, uh, emboli. Cleft. Cleft. Let me show you the cholesterol cleft. Give me one second. Yep. Right there. So show show uh, where that cholesterol emboli used to be because this is all the really needle shaped there. places, they're the good. cholesterol cleft, that is where it used to be. Mm -hmm. An interesting thing is that, like, as you said, in processing, they go away on the light microscopy. But on the immunofluorescence, they don't go away. So if you are suspecting cholesterol, you can polarize your IF slides and you will be able to see cholesterol. Yeah. And we do have many other videos on our YouTube channels, uh, and we'll put that in there. Um, and if you yes. have uh, ideas uh, for future sessions, please let us know. We want this to be a, a fun session. We're going to learn all together uh, and not be like a, just a normal lecture. We want to go through this with you. I agree with you. 
because as you speak and as you interact, you learn a lot. So you, we want to keep this very interactive. There was, a, if we have a, a few minutes left, uh, someone wanted to see the amyloid and immunotactoid fibrils one more time. Okay, fibrils. I thought you wanted to see an amyloid case. I could have shown you that there. And the good news is the middle one, which is 200, uh, has the DNA JB9 stain, which yes, you are really absolutely right, man. Because there's going to be less misdiagnosis of yeah. The other so ones. yeah, you can do now just the stain, and you can make a diagnosis. You know, this is amyloid. Okay. And this is fibrillary. Amyloid. And most of the time, like we are so accustomed to looking at them, you will be able to make a diagnosis on the low part itself, you know? And amyloid, you already know Congo red is there and you have IF, so you have restrictions. So you have a bunch of other parameters which are going to help you out in making the diagnosis. You don't have to make a diagnosis just on the EM. Yeah. Okay. Well, fantastic. Always uh, when I do path sessions of like, you need to do this like every week to get good at it. And that's true. You, you can't learn this and then not use it. I agree with you. But everyone did very well today. All the answers were good. And so I love the answers. Yeah. Great. We'll get this uh, posted on the YouTube channel and share yes. it via Twitter soon. Uh, Samira just posted our YouTube channel and you can learn about, we have a whole section on crystals, a whole section on casts, yes, uh, all, all types of fun stuff. Yes, there are a lot of sessions, so I have not covered in detail a lot of those, yeah. All right, Sri, if you want to stop your screen share and we can wrap this up for today. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.